Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today for what it proves to be a fascinating and timely conversation on Russia's politics, propaganda, and historical memory. Uh, we are joined by two absolutely fantastic rock star academics uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm going to first introduce uh, Dr. Jade McGlynn. She is a senior researcher at the Monterey Initiative for Russian Studies, where she's the co-director of the Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia and the Monterey Tri Trialogue Initiative. Oh, that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, holds a DPhil in Russian from the University of Oxford and has a forthcoming book, which I'm very excited to be reading and reviewing when it comes out. It is one of my top 2022 books to look forward to, The Kremlin's Memory Makers, which is due out later this year from Bloomsbury. And then Dr. Ben Noble, who is an associate fellow of Chatham House, uh, became in December of 2020 for the Russia and Eurasia program, a expert on Russian domestic politics. He's a lecturer on Russian politics at UCL School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies, and also the co-author of one of my best books of last year for 2021 with a diplomatic career, Navalny, Putin's Nemesis and Russia's, sorry, comma, Russia's Future, question mark. I need to make sure I get that right. Uh, we're very excited to be hosting uh, Dr. Uh, McGlynn and Dr. Noble today at the Center for the Study of Presidency and Congress because there's so much to talk about and what is happening in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, what I really want to do is just get straight into the conversation, uh, but I do want to leave it open for audience members to type in questions uh, into the Q&A function uh, as we go forward uh, as the dialogue continues. Uh, but starting off, I want to turn to, to Dr. Noble first. Looking at the forthcoming Victory Day parade on May 9th, uh, there has been no end of conjecture as to what President Putin is going to announce, if he's going to announce anything. Uh, he may declare victory, some are saying. He may announce a general mobilization and a formal declaration of war on Ukraine. Uh, this discussion, what do you see as reflecting on this discussion? And do we have really any insights into what is going to happen in five days time? Thanks, Joshua. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing what Jade says, because I'm going to make quite a general meta point, and that is reflecting on the nature of the conversation about what's going to happen on the 9th of May. I think, really, at a basic level, we don't know. And yet, in a classic display of people talking about Russian politics, we have many people, including on social media, stating confidently that they know exactly what's going to take place. For example, that Putin is going to declare victory. For example, that they're going to parade 500 uh, Ukrainian prisoners of war in red square. Uh, and this, I think, is a, an excellent case study in um, really the nature of the debate, the debate about Russia outside of Russia, that is people speaking confidently and covering all the bases. You see the whole thing that Putin is going to announce nothing, that he's going to announce everything. And so I think it's a great place to start this conversation because we have to confront head on the informational constraints that we face. And we have to show a bit of humility uh, when debating all of this stuff, that lots of the discussions by design are taken place by a very small number of people within the presidential administration in a way that limits outsiders ability to see what's going on. And I I suppose equally as importantly, these individuals, it's not as if they necessarily have a blueprint that's been set for weeks, months ahead. They will be changing their plan, including uh, possibly in response to the conversation that's taking place about these very events from outside the country. And so it becomes very complicated, very meta information becomes an important part of the conversation and not just facts on the ground. So I think that's the, the I think the, the starting point that I'm going to make that we don't really know what's going to be said on the 9th of May. Uh, but I imagine Jade will be able to say much more interesting stuff about the symbolism because the symbolism still really important. It is important. I suppose that, you know, is a caveat that I should add. The reason why so many people are, are stating things so confidently, so confidently about the 9th of May is because when it comes to political symbolism in Russia, it is a very important important date. And given the nature of uh, Russia's aggressive uh, um, activities towards Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, the invasion uh, that was launched on the 24th of February, it's understandable that people are focusing on um, the Victory Day parade. But I imagine Jade will be able to say more about that. So, so building off of that, uh, Jade, if I may, uh, Dr. McGlynn, um, building off of that, I mean, the the commemoration of the Great Patriotic War is obviously such a significant event within Russia. And I imagine it's even more so today because Russia is engaged in the special military operation in Ukraine. Uh, what are you gonna be looking for in this? What does it mean for Russia writ large, but what does it mean specifically today in this environment? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, um, and thank you for inviting me. Just, I suppose as well, to carry on from, um, from Ben's point there, um, I agree, I, I, we don't know what's going to happen um, on, on Victory Day, and I 
you know, don't have um, any sort of real confidence to say that that there'll be full mobilization, you know, like some people have claimed, or even that there'll be this prisoner of war um, parade, um, although it does increasingly feel like um, the Donetsk People's Republic are annexing Russia rather than vice versa. So perhaps it wouldn't it wouldn't be um, as big a shock as, as it might have been if you'd told me this before February um, <laughs> this year. I, I do think that one element we'll see um, is, um, and we already know this is going to happen, so this isn't really a prediction, but um, parades um, in, in occupied cities such as Kherson and Mariupol. Um, and I think that in a way those will be framed as at, at the very least as a partial victory uh, because these parades can be celebrated, because according to the Russian narrative, of course, um, in Ukraine, everybody has been banned um, from celebrating uh, World War II or the Great Patriotic War and every, um, you know, a sort of punishment of violence um, and fines. So this will be presented very much as, oh, OK, Herson and Mariupol get to hold their first um, uh, Victory Day parade, you know, the first one since 2014. Of course, it's not true. You can just go onto YouTube and watch the Victory Day uh, parades and celebrate, well, not necessarily parades, but celebrations um, over the last few years. But it will very much be, be uh, framed like that. And that's how um, that's in part how um, the Russian media sold um, the 2014 situation as, as a victory sort of as well as a way of dampening expectations of full annexation of um, Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics in 2014. This idea that because they could celebrate, um, because they could honour their forefathers, because they could celebrate um, World War II in the, in the Russian style, if you will, that that therefore represented a victory. And this then brings us into your larger question, um, Joshua, which is about the Great Patriotic War and particularly about its uses here. And I mean, I think one of the, I think we'll get into this a bit later on as well, but I think to a lot of people watching in the West, the idea that Russia is on this sort of denazification crusade sounds completely insane, but I don't think it does, it doesn't sound so insane. It doesn't sound insane at all really in the, in the Russian context, because this has been the narrative since 2014, since in the Russian view, there was this illegal, um, Putsch and Nazis or, or Banderovsi, sort of what we will for the, the essentially the followers of, of the wartime national, uh, the World War II time nationalist leader Stefan Bandera, that these people came to power and since then they've been trying to rewrite and overturn the Great Patriotic War. And of course, part of this is about delegitimizing Ukrainians, and that's been done, you know, since. What, to de since the Soviet era to delegitimize Ukrainian claims to sovereignty by by claiming that there's something especially fascist or, or nationalistic or even Nazi about about their um their identity or their wish for sovereignty but also it's about mobilizing Russians because um if we look at sort of polls taken at the end of of last year we can see sort of 89 percent of Russians um, list the great patriotic war as um, one of the things that they feel sort of most proud about in their country um, and the memory, you know, it is meaningful. I've recently, I mean, this is slightly more anecdotal uh, for the time being, but I was recently speaking to somebody who certainly would not be described as um, as pro-war, though it might be difficult to describe them bluntly as anti-war either, but they were saying how no Russians could support the type of war that we in the West think the Russians are fighting um, because they imbibe the memory of um, the Great Patriotic War with their mother's milk. Um, this was that's a direct quote. Um, so this idea that um, the Great Patriot War is something very special, but also something very personal. It's still it's still very personal, and, and the Kremlin has been very good at appropriating a lot of, of personal grassroots movements. But unfortunately, there's way too much I could say on this. So I'm actually going to stop now. I'm at risk of going off onto a random tangent. That's <laughs> not at all. This is fantastic. I'm curious to, to build off of that as well, because one of the things that uh, has been particularly interesting in the United States, and I, I can't speak to the United Kingdom, but the coverage of in the run up to the war in Ukraine, there was a New York Times piece, for example, that presented the, the militarization of Russian society and the use of the Great Patriotic War and everything from school children's events to uh, ROTC like programs. And for a lot of the commentators here in Washington, it was this very uh, backward looking perspective, uh, trying to go back to a period of time where perhaps things were clearer. But is that actually the case in the way that the Great Patriotic War is applied? Is it purely a retrospective looking or is it uh, something to which they should the country looks to aspire to a time when things were clear, but that's what they should go to in the future or aspire to, I should say? <laughs> 
I think it is very backwards looking just by its nature. I think it, the fact that there has to be this focus on history, I think it reveals a few issues in Russian society, to put it mildly, the first of which is that quite clearly um, the, the Kremlin doesn't really have a, something to aim for. I mean, this, these sort of broad ideas of, of sovereignty. Um, that's nice, but what does it actually mean? They, they don't really have a compelling vision for the future. Um, and the other aspect is, you know, that Russian society is a society with divisions um, that I think is something that isn't always um, understood properly um, in, the, in, in the West. So it's very hard, for example, to use ethnic, ethno-nationalism to sort of cohere the Russian um, people because, of course, there's so many different nationalities there. Again, it's very hard to use religion or orthodoxy because you've got four official religions and many, many more unofficial religions. Um, it, you can't use ideology because there isn't really an, an ideology and you, you can't use civic nationalism because for, for very obvious reasons about just the reality of, of Russia and its political system. So history and in particular these sort of few events, maybe um, his, uh, the Great Patriotic War, going into, um, going into space, Yuri Gagarin, the, the trauma of the 1990s as well as a sort of negative use, they are some of the few... Uh, I suppose unifying ideas that that help to, to to bond the nation. You know these ideas that, that every nation needs to keep them together. The only area where I would say perhaps that helps to bring it into the the future, uh, not into the future so much as into the present. Sorry, is there's really um, um, an emphasis on the idea that people are trying to, particularly the West, uh, particularly Ukraine, the Baltic states, but also internal enemies, um, as they might be called by Kremlin propagandists, um, are trying to rewrite history, that they are trying to destroy the memory of the Great Patriotic War, which genuinely is very, um, you know, which genuinely is cherished and very meaningful to people and has this personal um, element because of so many, of course, the, the, the sheer number um, of losses. Um, normally, most people say around 27 million of, of, um, for, for the entire Soviet Union, but um, a lot of families, of course, therefore have this personal memory, this familial memory. And so people do take that quite personally, this idea that, um, that, that the West in particular is trying to, to turn Russia into the villains, um, that um, nobody is grateful to Russia uh, for liberating them, which of course many, many countries in Eastern Europe aren't grateful to Russia for liberating them. Um, or to the Soviet Union for liberating them. So that's the way I think that it gets brought into the present is this idea that memory, that the very essence of Russian identity, the best thing they've ever done, not only are people not grateful for it, but they're trying to overturn it. And in part, that's what this, um, I think that's what the conflict with Ukraine has always been framed in as well, this idea of the right to respect what Russians say is historical truth. And essentially that just means their view of World War II or their view of history. And I think that also explains some of this madness around who's being called a Nazi right now, because I think in in this in this narrative, you know, Nazis are whoever Russia says are Nazis. Essentially to be a Nazi, you just have to not completely agree with Russia's view of the Great Patriotic War, um, which it's pretty impossible to do if you've read the history book, to be honest with you. Um, so, so, so I guess that sort of ends up leaving everybody pretty much as Nazis. Right, ben, I want to turn to the, the domestic component of this one because there, there's an interesting dichotomy where right now so much of the war in Ukraine is being placed obviously on Putin as being like the prime actor when it comes to the war. But at the same time, he's part of a you know, very polycentric political ecosystem where he's one among many of power competing bases of the oligarchs, and the Duma and everything. How is this war playing out at home in a domestic political consideration and construct? What are we missing by just focusing on Putin as the, the military actor, if you will? It's a very small question, Josh. I'll be able to answer it in a minute. Uh, yeah, there's lots in there. Uh, let me begin by uh, making the point that before the invasion, one of my bugbears was the fact that when talking about Russian politics and governance, people would almost exclusively talk about Vladimir Putin. They would say, if only we could get inside his head, we would be able to understand Russian politics, uh, the country, and, and how governance works. And, and I wrote a piece with um, Katarina Schulman for Chatham House trying to debunk that myth. Lots of other people have, have made similar points, but um, we stated it uh, uh, 
relatively recently and, and quite pithily to try and get across the point that, yes, Putin is powerful. Yes, it's a personalist authoritarian regime, but that doesn't mean that you can't look at other actors, uh, institutions. Sometimes Putin, even if he is very powerful, he won't want to get involved in particular decisions and particular policy choices because he's either not interested or because he doesn't want to get in the middle of competing interest groups um, uh, who have different visions for what this particular policy choice should, should be. So we see lots of examples of Putin just not being involved in really important decisions. However, when it comes to the invasion, he is front and central. He is the architect of this. He is the person beating the drum. This is his personal project. We can link it to his essay from the summer last year, calling into question um, uh, the, the notion, the very notion of Ukrainian statehood, and that, that is, of course, a trope that's been perpetuated by him and by other officials in Russia ever since, and that's been intensified since the invasion. But my point would be, for the invasion, yes, Putin is central. We have to, though, focus on his relationship with his um, uh, inside circle, this sort of inner circle, who uh, it seems to be, according to the intelligence that we've got, a small number of them were involved in the decision making about the invasion, but most of the elite wasn't. And that is one of the explanations why the implementation wasn't as effective as, as Putin had imagined, because he concocted this plan in secret. Then he announced that he tried to cascade this decision down the power vertical, as the Kremlin likes to call it, which conveys this idea that Putin says and then everybody does and they're implemented very efficiently. That just didn't happen. Kiev was not taken by the 27th of uh, February. So that tells us something about the nature of the political system, that even if Putin can be the ultimate decision maker in certain areas, it does not guarantee that that particular decision will be implemented. Uh, and we've seen lots of areas in which the governance system does not just boil down to one person because Putin can't personally implement an invasion. He has to rely on structures that sometimes break down, that are less efficient. The way we see um, uh, forms of various shades of resistance or incompetence. Uh, and, and so I think the invasion is quite an interesting case study that, that combines that duality that can sometimes seem a bit paradoxical, that Putin is really powerful, but also at the same time, he can be very um, uh, impotent in his ability to actually get what he wants. Uh, looking more broadly at the domestic context uh, and the elite, I think we've seen a really interesting pattern when it's come to uh, the elite's reaction to the invasion on the 24th of February. The reason why I'm mentioning the date, of course, the invasion, broadly speaking, goes back to 2014. So we shouldn't forget that. So when I'm talking about the invasion, I'll often be uh, just uh, referring to the 24th of February, but we, we shouldn't forget that broader context. But I think initially there was lots of shock and disquiet. And that is uh, a useful example to people who think that uh, the elite thinks as one block. Uh, it's certainly not the case. Uh, lots of people weren't involved in that decision making. And um, uh, there was an extreme amount of disquiet of people who thought, why on earth are we doing that? So that I think was maybe the first phase of the reaction of the elite to the invasion. Um, uh, but then it's interesting, after that moment of disquiet, um, uh, we saw a sort of rallying around the flag effect, which we imagine to see when, when countries go to war. And that was seen both within the elite, but also within the population. And what's interesting in that phase is that even for those people, at least some of them, who might initially have been shocked, shown disquiet, shown various forms of quiet resistance to the invasion, uh, they might have then rallied um, uh, around this particular mission because they thought, well, hang on, we're in a situation now with Western sanctions. We're all in the same boat. Um, uh, you know, we might might have, have shown resistance initially, but now we're going to change our position, not because we necessarily agree with the invasion, um, uh, but for various other reasons that might make people cohere. And I think that was an interesting development when we sort of think about these different phases in the elite's reaction to the invasion. But more recently, we're seeing reporting about cracks within the elite. Um, and we have to be careful, of course, with any reporting saying that a coup is imminent. I don't think a coup is imminent, but it's still important to remain aware, remain sensitive to um, these various suggestions that members of the elite groups within the elite uh, are uh, not on board with what's going on, that they're realizing that actually this is catastrophic for the Russian state, for the Russian economy, the Russian people, um, uh, and the, the country's reputation, historical reputation, I don't think we should forget those different phases because they show uh, that it's not a simple story uh, about the elite just doing what Putin wants to do. Um, but the real question, and I don't think we have a good answer to it, is what would the elite 
how should I put it? Uh, what would be the signals of the elite really being annoyed with Putin and thinking about trying to defect from the political system or whichever version of uh, challenging the, the, the political system um, uh, we might imagine? Uh, we don't have a good answer. Um, but it, again, it's another case where on social media, we have lots of people confidently stating that they do know what's taking place. Uh, and luckily, there are other people on social media re ready to slap them down and say, hang on, we have no idea what's going on because uh, this is a point that Sam Green has made before. If a coup is going to happen, we'll hear about it once it's taken place, or at least once somebody's actually started. Any idea that people go around Moscow saying, oh, shall we try and take out Putin? Absolute nonsense. Um, uh, so, you know, if we're thinking about uh, uh, humility again and our informational constraints, this is another great example. We sh shouldn't get carried away. You know, you get a sense that maybe people buy into that narrative because it conforms with what they want. But I would respond to those people um, uh, and certainly not as an argument to support Putin and keep him in place. But if Putin were to be deposed, we just have to think about the likely individuals who would replace him. And one individual is Nikolai Patrushev, who's the Secretary of the Security Council. And if he were to be President of Russia, then things might be even scarier. Again, I'm not making that point to suggest that we should uh, support Putin as the lesser of two evils. But those people who um, are sort of cheering on the possibility of a coup should be mindful of the various different possibilities from that. I think there is a fascinating biography to be written of Pashashev, and I would certainly be very interested in reading it uh, if there, anyone has ever written in English, because he's a, a deeply interesting figure. Uh, Jade, turning to you on this one, so, so Ben very astutely kind of described sort of the elite politics in the current situation at the sort of the elite inner circle within the Kremlin. How is this war playing out amongst the average Russian? Uh, we've seen the presentation of the Z icon as being sort of a, a rallying icon. Um, how is it playing out at home within sort of the average Russian, such as the, there is an average Russian? Um, first, I would just want to say that I think if there is a biography to be written of Patricia, then Mark Galiotti has first um, in English. I think Mark Galiotti has first dibs. Um, we'll, have to, but, we'll have to poke him on that one. <laughs> I'm probably taking about two weeks. Um, but um, in any case, um, to return to your question. Um, so obviously it's... it's any answer, I think, just has to, to this question, just has to start with caveats, 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 because it's so, I mean, it's really questionable how useful polling can be um, in a political environment that, that Russia is now, which is, you know, where there's so much censorship and where um, it's the, the thought of protesting or, um, is genuinely terrifying. And I, I'm not sure if somebody called me up from, <laughs> from a polling agency, I would particularly want to tell them, you know, oh, that I really disliked the war, you know, and or even to call it a war, knowing that to do so, you know, is is illegal. Um, and, and could incur a hefty fine or even depending on how you um, present this view, um, even, even prison time. I mean, it's just, I think we do have to ask how, how useful are polls. However, there's been a, quite a lot of, of, of excellent work um, done to try to work out sort of preference falsification and different aspects that I think broadly, um, and, and maybe Ben will come and, and <laughs> tell me off of this, but I think broadly it's okay to, to say that um, generally um, that we have of course seen this rally around the flag effect and there does seem to be um, a majority um, or certainly a lot of, of public support for the war um, in Russia. Now, why that is, is also an interesting question. I know there's some incipient research being done on this um, that suggests that, you know, it's not necessarily because everybody completely signs up and just parrots um, the, the sort of Kremlin propaganda view. They might have different reasons. Some of it might just be, you know, my country, right or wrong. Um, some of it might be... Um, because um, you know they're even more nationalist than the Kremlin, they feel like the Kremlin hasn't hasn't gone far enough. And you do see, um, going back to some of the points um, that the Ben was making, you do start to see some cracks um, between um, some of the more nationalist or more extreme elements um, calling, you know, certainly members of the presidential administration or um, people like um, Peskov or even. Um, my favorite, um, Vladimir Medinsky, um, sort of national traitors for, for not, um, for even sort of considering that not everybody who disagrees with the war or doesn't love the war um, is, um, is a traitor themselves or even for suggesting some sort of concession. So there is still a lot of, of variation um, in, in opinion um, 
even among those who who might might support the war. I think if you, we come to the sort of the Z point, um, I have to say at first I was really confused by the Z because I just thought, what this just doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, why are they using this um, when they have much more useful symbols? But actually, as time's gone on, I've started to think that it's it's less bizarre than it seemed um, because clearly it's pretty empty signifier other than presumably um, just as a reference to um, uh, the, the um, weaponry and uh, army um, machinery that was going towards Ukraine. But other than that, essentially, it's kind of, it's pretty empty um, signifier. But I'm starting to think maybe that's actually its power in that now, we, every time we see the Z, pretty much it's as a St. George's ribbon. So the um, what has become the, the symbol for commemoration of the Great Patriotic War. And I think actually it's very emptiness is helping to sort of merge it with the ribbon and almost to fill it with World War II, to fill it with World War II's emptiness. It's kind of like an empty, an empty vassal um, and it can be like subsumed within the memory of the war and, and filled with that. And already we see that a little bit um, with elements such as the Immortal Regiment procession, you know, where Russians... Um, march with a portrait um, of those um, who, who took part in, in World War II. And this year, those immortal regiments are going to also include um, those who've been fighting in Ukraine. So again, we see this conflation um, of, of the Great Patriotic War and, and the war in Ukraine that, to be honest, we have been seeing since 2014. But of course, um, this is just taking on sort of a whole, a whole, a whole other aspect. Um, so um that's that's my thinking at the moment on Z, but it's more it's more a hypothesis than than a sort of firm firm opinion it's interesting that you mentioned the the oh sorry go ahead ben no i was just going to jump in and say Please. uh i think it's a great point from jade that it's an empty signifier that can then be filled with whatever the kremlin wants to fill it with or uh, you know the the army of propagandists that they have and that's consistent with other features of this particular conflict and it relates to a great thread that jade has a running thread about the shifting declared war aims i think it's a great example of um uh, looking at officials and what they claim to be and and you know members of state media what they claim to be the goal of what the Russian authorities call the special military operation in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the ongoing war. Um, uh, the fact that that shifting um, uh, is, is sort of, is a, there's a nebulousness to it, which means that they can't be pinned down, they can't be held accountable, they can't um, be pointed to by the Russian population if for whatever reason they declare victory and it isn't what lots of people imagined. Um, uh, uh, and that means that they, they can't be held accountable. Of course, the downside of that is that it might mean that people foster an idea of what a victory looks like and when Putin finally says well this is this is it some people might be alienated even if some uh, are happy with it but maybe that's another point that we can discuss later on in this conversation um but the you know the the, the changeability of the war aims the lack of specificity i think maps onto uh, the notion of the z and that might be quite an abstract point but it i think uh, broadly speaking um uh, underscores the fact that lots of this is being improvised it's being made up and part of that reflects I think you know uh, even that small group of people who decided who knew that the invasion was going to take place they didn't have a plan for what was going to happen after the 27th of February um, you know we, we, sh we shouldn't forget that yes there of course uh, uh, thinking about recent political history there are other examples of conflicts in which people haven't planned um, very far in advance and we've seen how that can play out I think we're just seeing it happen right now uh, and lots of improvisation um, and you know uh, Jade mentioned Mark Galeotti I think uh, uh, he would be on board with the idea that improvisation is also a feature of, of entrepreneurs within the political system that not all of this is being dictated um, from a room within the presidential administration. We la have, have lots of um, autonomous actors trying to do things that they think will please higher ups. And yes, that is a function of loyalty. So the presidential administration is implicated, uh, but we're not seeing a blueprint um, uh, being referred to and a plan being rolled out seamlessly. That's definitely not the case. Going back to Jade's point about polling data. Yeah, I think we can now say that uh, it seems to be that a majority of Russians um, are supportive of what they think is taking place in Ukraine. 
Uh, but as Jade said, caveats, caveats, caveats. Part of that is because uh, we don't, you know, as social scientists, we don't have the, the tools and historians, we don't necessarily have the tools to be able to work out what is going on. Um, but in that situation, I think Jade, Jade is right to say, well, rather than trying to get a firm answer of what proportion of the Russian population support what they think is going on in Ukraine, um, we try and work out why is it the case that the Kremlin has been able to get that level of support. And that means that we have to look into the past. Um, we have to look at, for example, the role that the Great Patriotic War uh, and victory has in the Russian political imagination. But it also relates to more recent things, like uh, the way in which the Kremlin did some really diligent, careful work in framing the idea of sanctions. That even before the invasion, when people, uh, senior state officials are saying, we're not going to invade Ukraine. Why? Why would we want to? Um, that they were still saying that the West is itching to impose sanctions on Russia in order to undermine the country, to destabilize it, to destroy the economy. And so that is just one part, one element of the lots of different threads that I think the authorities have been able to draw on uh, and in a way that has surprised lots of observers um, outside of the country. Um, uh, regarding the ability for, for example, the rally around the flag effect to be so effective. You know, I, I think there was lots of uh, commentary initially, I think you know, I even uh, predicted that we wouldn't see a rise in Putin's approval ratings to the same degree that we saw with the annexation of Crimea. But it seems to be we're in very similar territory. Uh, and, you know, my explanation was that Donbass is not Crimea. And that uh, that would mean that any rally around the flag effect bump in his approval ratings would be would be more muted. Um, but that hasn't been the case. And so I think we have to look at these various threads that have been have been drawn together. And one very final point is that looking at the polling figures is an, another example of how um, uh, observers outside of Russia can sometimes use Russia as a platform to project their political views and ideological uh, positions, but also their hopes for what Russia might be. Uh, and, and so when looking at the polling data, sometimes you learn much more about the position of the individual who's commenting on the polling data in the Russia that they'd want to see, um, rather than the reality of what uh, lots of Russians think about what's taking place. And, you know, in a sense, that's understandable. Uh, but but we should be very cautious um, uh, when we see people interpreting uh, polling data that we're not just seeing those numbers through their own eyes, uh, and only, for example, saying, that we can trust the figures when it conforms to what they want to see. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a fantastic point. I'm actually glad that you brought up Jade's fantastic thread, which I think is at over 60 tweets now at this point of various uh, iterations. More of, surely, isn't it? It's nearly, it's, is it 70, around maybe? 100? 76. 76. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I'll have to, have to send everyone the link afterwards to follow because it is absolutely fascinating. The, the number and diversity of war aims enemies of the state that have been identified. It seems like everything from obviously denazification to combating witchcraft to everything else and in between. Um, I'm curious on that aspect. I mean, what Ben had brought up in terms of the, the evolution of this, the absence of a plan, definitive plan. Um, how do you see this? Is it, is it very much that sort of that evolutionary process? Is it trying to see what sticks? Is it a constantly changing process of the narrative? Um, and how do you see that progressing forward? Um, so I don't think it's, I think um, Ben made some really, really interesting and relevant points there about these threads that the, the Kremlin sort of been um, been um, laying, I suppose, and now is able to, to, to pick up. Um, and a lot of the narratives that we see, um, they've they've been there since since at least 2012 i mean probably probably actually a lot a lot longer but it's just um that i can speak with more confidence about the narrative since 2012 because they're the only ones i've really done any sort of large-scale analysis of um so ben there mentioned a point around sanctions um you know other um, another one is the idea that the west does want to destroy um russia which actually links in quite closely with sanctions um so for a lot of people, some of the accusations that have been made, they're not, they're not new. They don't see this as a change in narrative. They just see this as a narrative that they already know that's been ongoing, you know, that maybe ebbs and flows depending on, on what's happening in the world or what's happening inside Russia. But um, it doesn't seem like such a wild shift, I don't think, um, to, to Russian audiences. Um, as perhaps it seems from the outside looking in when it's decontextualized, you know, of the last, um, uh, you know, at least decade. 
um, in which in which these narratives have been placed. That said, of course, there is also this attempt, I suppose, um, to to undermine um, information that that comes through from from the Western information space. So elements, um, I mean, the obvious example here was with um, the, the the massacres um, of civilians in Butcher, where um, although the Russians must have known for, for obvious reasons that that um, the information was going to come to light about the about the dead civilians they really only started reacting once western media um, began covering it and first of all you know and we it's very similar kind of pattern that you also see um you also saw say with mh17 or with the scripple poisonings or with, with various of these sorts of incidents which is first of all, it's just all oh, hang on a minute. What they're saying, i.e., what the West is saying, that's should we? Um, we're not saying it's not true. We're not saying it didn't happen this way. It was just oh, okay. I, I'm not sure about the reliability of that person or the reliability of that version. Then afterwards, it's okay. Not just can't you trust this person, but also here's this bit of evidence. Oh, and here's this bit of evidence. We really can't know what's going on. Then a bit more evidence. And then eventually you end up with pretty much a narrative that actually supports a much longer um, and more, well, more credible in Russian, in, in, in many Russians' eyes, narrative, which is that, um, you know, e evil Ukrainian Nazis shot their own people because they supported the Russians, which feeds into this idea of, of course, most Ukrainians just want to, you know, be one with their, with their brotherly Russian um, Russian neighbors and um, they're being prevented from doing so either because they're brainwashed or because they're essentially oppressed by um, by Nazis um, who've, who've taken over since since 2014 or, or Nazi-esque um, formations so eventually you do get to something that's quite coherent and I think often in the West we look at this um, um, the way that um, the truth is attacked um, but we don't also look at how Perhaps Russian propaganda builds builds its own truth or its own its own version of truth that actually is more more stable than than it might appear um, to, to, to people. And on on that, Josh, I, I think it's if we're thinking about elements that we're missing in the broader conversation and maybe things that we're getting wrong or not quite getting right. I think there is still a lingering feeling that I see in some uh, Western commentary that if only Russians were able to watch what we see on the evening news for an hour, they would immediately be, oh, well, no, this is outrageous what's going on, um, that they would be immediately uh, uh, anti-war, that they would be immediately anti-Putin. But that really is just nonsense. And it's nonsense for some of the reasons that we've just uh, uh, that Jade and I have just suggested, that lots of this groundwork has built um, a particular conception of the political regime, of the nature of the conflict, that means that people don't just shift from zero to one of pro or anti. There's lots of grey in between, and the academic Jeremy Morris has written some fantastic blog posts on this, trying to make sense of people's cognitive adaptability to new information. So initially they might see um, a picture, a narrative on the Russian state uh, TV evening news and they say okay but then they get a phone call from a relative saying hmm well this isn't quite going down as as the russian state is portraying it uh and we see various ways in which people can take on that new information but it doesn't fundamentally alter uh, their view of the world because we have to remember what that would entail uh, people who are within the country who have spent um their lives with a with a certain idea of the state uh, and maybe over the last what just more than 20 years of who putin is what he's done uh and and, and so there are lots of reasons why we're not likely to see a very, very quick shift in public opinion, even if more Russians become aware of the nature of the atrocities in Ukraine. And so I think rather than focusing exclusively on the informational environment, we also have to take into account um, the economic consequences of sanctions. And we have to remember that sanctions are still relatively new. I don't think serious analysts of sanctions thought that we would have imposition of sanctions. Oligarchs get annoyed. They tap Putin on the shoulder and say, stop the war, otherwise we're going to uh, you know, carry out a coup. That fundamentally misunderstands how oligarchs uh, currently function in the political and economic system in Russia. But it also and misunderstands the the nature of sanctions. I think the sanctions that that have been imposed are for the medium to long term, and when the as according to people like the the head of the central bank in Russia, Alvira Nabiulina, when things really start to bite and when they start to hurt, uh, and that will begin around summer, then we could be in a very very different situation. And there the question will be: Well, who do Russians start to blame? 
Do they shift their blame from the West that they've been prepped to blame uh, even before the invasion? Uh, or do they start blaming the Kremlin? I think there are strong reasons to think that it's going to take a lot for them to start blaming the Kremlin, including because the presidential administration has taken steps to um, preemptively to try and deflect that blame. Uh, so they have given more authorities to regional heads in order to deal with the economic implications of sanctions. And that's not because the presidential administration sincerely believes that regional governors are going to be the ones to take the best calls it's so that the kremlin can say well if things are going bad with the economy don't blame us we devolved that authority to your regional governor so take it out on them and that does fit a broader pattern of the presidential administration uh, institutionally setting things up uh, so that they can't be blamed you know we saw a very very similar pattern uh, at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, where they said regional governors would be uh, uh, given more authorities to deal with it. Again, that's not because they had special competencies. It's because the Kremlin didn't want to be blamed when things went wrong. Uh, building on that, um, I want to come back to the, the regional government aspect of it, but the, the conditioning of the Russian population over the last you know several years to this current conflict, one of the narratives that's been making the rounds, certainly here in Washington, is that once the unfortunately, when the bodies start coming home, when the casualties, which seem quite significant based on intelligence reporting, uh, you know, far out, far exceeding already what has been lost over the 10 years of Afghanistan, uh, Russia's involvement, Soviet Union's involvement in Afghanistan, once those start coming home, that the Russian people will start, uh, the narrative is, is laid out, that they will start putting pressure on the Kremlin or on Putin to change this pattern of behavior. Do you see that to be the case or believe that as a, a possibility based on what you've sort of outlined thus far? Um, personally, I'm not entirely convinced or certainly not for the short term or medium term, because, um, of course, the, the soldiers numbers committees had in Afghanistan, in the Soviet war in Afghanistan, you know, they did have a real effect, but the Soviet war in Afghanistan went on for a pretty long time. And we're currently on day 70 um, of this conflict. So I think it, it's a bit too soon. Um, there are also some other reasons. So I think um, that um, for a start at the moment, I don't think that it's clear in Russia quite how, I think it's starting to see, starting to sort of weed its way in um, quite how badly this this has gone. But I don't think it's it's anywhere near as, as clear to the Russian population. And a lot of the time, um, there's a lot of stonewalling. So we saw that with the sinking, for example, of the Moskva, where it seems like 28 people died, um, but the Russians eventually have uh, muted one, and then they're stonewalling. And I don't know if I, if I put myself in that position, I would not want to believe that my son was dead. Um, so I probably wouldn't necessarily think that he was just because it's just a natural human reaction. But even let's say for those parents who do find out that their that their son or their their husband or their brother is dead, I think then you always you if they're already dead you you'd really want them it's quite a human reaction that you would want them to have died for something and i think um if we come back to whether or not that will i mean that that could make them want the war to end but i don't think it means that they will accept what the brutality and the horror of russia's war in ukraine because i think then they would have to accept that that's how their son or their brother or their husband or their father died and i just don't see anybody accepting that willingly um you know, instead of, oh, he died as a hero fighting, you know, Nazis and liberating our sort of Ukrainian brethren, actually, no, he, he died sort of, you know, as part of a, a genocidal campaign against against people who actually, you know, our cousins live in Ukraine or whatever. I think that's, I think that's, a, that's quite a hard thing to ask people to accept. Though, one thing that I find quite interesting recently is this emphasis that the, that is being made in sort of propaganda channels on um, the idea of invisible heroes. And I think that when it becomes clear that people's children have died, that people's sons have died, or, or, or you know, relatives have died in the war fighting, and the and the Kremlin is still sort of, or not just the Kremlin, but local authorities, sorry, are, are stonewalling, then I think that could cause issues because it will be that feeling that almost the government isn't letting them inscribe themselves into these hero, like sort of narratives of heroism, and that they're almost, you know. Us versus them, is, it's a great narrative. It's always a very powerful narrative. If you stop letting people become a part of the us, then I think that could that could lead to problems. So it'd be interesting to see because it's pretty obvious why the Kremlin can't admit all of the deaths, but at the same point, there's, you know, there's unintended consequences of, of not doing so. Ben, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to make the point that, you know, one of the basic ways in which 
the, beyond information control, um, uh, one of the ways in which the Kremlin can try and insulate the Russian population from quite how bad things have got, quite how many uh, people have died, is uh, relates to change practices regarding moving bodies, that bodies just aren't, some of them aren't just making their way back um, uh, to uh, the families within Russia. Uh, and uh, again, caveat, 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 we, we, we haven't got a complete purchase on uh, how widespread that issue is, but it does fit a pattern where whereby the Kremlin wants to um, uh, insulate uh, the Russian population from that information. Because even though I said before that we should be cautious in thinking what that information would do uh, to sentiment within Russia, at the same time, the Kremlin does want to take steps uh, to make its life as easy as possible, uh, including shaping the media environment, including the information that's provided to family members of those uh, Russian soldiers um, serving in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, that, I think, is a story that we have to keep an eye on. Um, uh, but beyond that, I think Jade covered um, all of the key bases. I want to look ahead a little bit to the, the September Unified Day of Elections that's forthcoming. And we're, I know we started the conversation looking at five days out, and now we're looking at several months out. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how the war in Ukraine will play out in those elections. Uh, will they continue as planned for that matter? But how will this play out uh, in those elections? Uh, what are your thoughts are on that? Jade, if, if you don't mind me uh, starting off and then, um, uh, it's a really interesting question. We have seen uh, quite a shambolic um, line from the uh, senior state officials in Russia about these elections. Uh, some statements that they're going ahead as planned, and then other statements that they're going to be cancelled, or at least uh, gubernatorial elections, so elections for the heads of, of the regions in Russia, uh, those elections that are taking place in September, um, uh, that they might be that they might be cancelled. So I think that is an issue that's going to play out, but it's a classic case of the presidential administration um, not being decisive because it's trying to work out what is the institutional configuration that's best going to suit it. And I think they're going to try and delay uh, for as long as possible making a decision in that regard. Uh, and if we're talking about patterns, that is a classic pattern um, when it comes to elections of, of, of fixing the rules so that the Kremlin um, can get the results or at least can maximize the chances that it gets the result that it wants. Uh, so I think it's more fruitful before we have an answer to that question to think about the Donbass consensus. So this is the equivalent to the Crimea consensus that we saw in 2014, where the uh, major political opposition parties, and that's opposition in quotation marks, um, rally around the flag when it comes to politics as well. Uh, and there is a sense uh, within the presidential administration that that's great because it can mean that everybody tries to uh, you know, s sing from the same song sheet, that we don't see divisive uh, debate about policy that if um, a particular political opposition figures say things that go off message then they can be disciplined saying oh well are you not patriots uh, why are you not agreeing with this so that's a sort of a, a way in which uh, the presidential administration can try and maintain that consensus and so I think going into the September elections what we should be looking out for um, are further steps taking against the communist party so the communist party um, uh, the major uh, institutional manifestation of what the Russians call the systemic opposition so that's the co-opted opposition yes um, the party and individuals, members of the party can sometimes say things that seem oppositional, but broadly speaking, they um, uh, agree things with the presidential administration beforehand. That has been challenged in the last few years. There are, uh, especially in the regions and young, younger officials, are uh, frustrated with that cooptation with the Kremlin and want the party to be more genuinely oppositional, to be autonomous. And that's why we've seen various steps taken against people, including uh, a former deputy of the Sarata Regional Legislature, Nikolai uh, Bandarenka, who uh, is a, actually a quite successful YouTuber. Uh, and because he was kicking up a stinking, making trouble for the regional authorities, uh, he was kicked out of the regional legislature earlier this year, ostensibly for not declaring income that he made from his his YouTube channel. Uh, so that's one case. And there are lots of other cases. The Communist Party, now that the Navalny movement has been neutered within Russia, essentially, the Communist Party has become, organisationally at least, the most important oppositional force, even if, historically speaking, it's been an 
oppositional force. We're just seeing a blurring of that boundary. And that means that um, uh, Communist Party officials in the run up to the September elections uh, will come under increasing heat from the authorities of various levels. And again, this is a, a, a sort of warning that it's not all necessarily centrally dictated by the presidential administration. We can see maybe local and regional authorities putting pressure on the Communist Party because they think that is what the Kremlin would like and they might be rewarded for it. Um, uh, and so go, going forward, I'm going to be looking at those cases of the Communist Party um, uh, being detained, being arrested, being uh, charged with um, uh, various offences as a way uh, for them um, uh, to be disciplined and to fall back into line. Uh, uh, but over to Jade. That's very little. <laughs> I wish I would even dare to add or, or, or would want to add to that. Um, I suppose just to come back to the point about the, the, sham, the shambolicness, um, I, and I think that's probably um, the point I suppose that I'm most interested in is just to what extent um, the veneer that's obviously been chipped and chipped and chipped and chipped away until it's just a sliver of veneer of, of some kind of democratic element within the authoritarian system, to what extent any of that will will remain. I think that that would be sort of the area that I'm interested in and also among the younger, the younger communists who, who sort of had their navalny tendencies, some of them. Um, I'm interested to see what happens there, but it it doesn't seem like a very it doesn't seem like a very fruitful um territory so yeah like pretty much like men really yeah it's it, it, it it's interesting that you really do get a sense you know people spoke before about within the Kremlin, people talk about the battle between the towers, and that is the battle between the different groups. And sometimes those groups would be called more liberal and some more conservative or more hawkish. And you often heard people talking about the hawks winning over the liberals. And I think broadly speaking, that story is correct when we look at the visibility of individuals and, and the apparent influence they have over the direction of policy in recent years. Since the invasion, you really get a sense that those people who were concerned with maintaining that veneer of managing democracy, even if it's managed, who still thought that it was important for the regime's legitimacy, both domestically and internationally, uh, to carry on um, uh, staged elections, um, to allow some degree of competition, even if very small, uh, uh, for various different uh, roles, one of them being uh, window dressing, but others uh, in order um, uh, maybe to gain information about support for different officials at different levels of the Federation, uh, that those people really have been sidelined. Some of them are still in office, but you get the sense that whereas maybe they would have been uh, indulged previously by their uh, hawkish colleagues, now the hawks are really dominant. And for them, carrying on the performance of democracy really isn't important. Uh, and so I think we saw that last year when Navani returned. They just took the gloves off and said, we've managed you previously, now we're going to crush you. Um, and so going forward, I think it's going to be really interesting to see whether the basic model, if we just look at the state Duma, of having united Russia, having a constitutional majority, Kremlin controlled, the Kremlin doesn't have to worry about the legislative process, and yet they still have the Communist Party, the Liberal Democratic Party, Adjust Russia, and a few other groups who form the opposition, um, whether that model will be challenged. Uh, the LDPR was recently led um, by uh, an individual called Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Uh, we could have a whole hour talking about him and what he means, but in so far as he's died and that was a very personalist political party that is one reason why this broader setup for how democracy is managed in Russia that might be shaken up so if we think about longer term implications of the invasion uh, and the individuals in the presidential administration what they think about um, democracy and how it's managed I should say democracy um, I realize I've been doing lots of air quotes and I can I know that that's slightly frustrating but you know sometimes you just you, you just have to do it so I'm, I'm just going to continue um, that that might be shaken up uh, and so in the in the medium term that's that's an element that I'm that I'm going to be focusing on and so it could be that a newer party um, uh, uh, is, is is set up or, or, or the system is shaken up we see Zuganov the head of the communist party may be replaced by somebody else uh, who knows I mean there we're getting into conjecture 
but uh, somebody who has to teach um, uh, in this this coming autumn Russian politics, I'm going to have to rewrite lots of my stuff. And I imagine I'm going to have to continue rewriting it for the next few years because of this fundamental shakeup. Uh, and so the invasion isn't just a question of, you know, um, military aggression and international politics. It does have profound implications for Russian politics and, uh, and society more broadly. Uh, so, Jade, we, we've heard very much what, what Ben is looking at in the near to medium term. I'm curious because we're, we're coming up on the sort of last five minutes of our conversation. The things that you're looking at and think others should be looking at that aren't being discussed right now, um, certainly here in Washington, I mean, the domestic political co context that Ben outlined, which is absolutely fascinating, is not even on the radar at all, uh, candidly. But, you know, so we should be looking at that. You know, what would you say Washington policymakers should be looking at that they aren't presently? Um, I think, to be honest with you, we've covered um, a fair amount of it. Um, in particular, um, I think it sounds like a buzzword, but, but that sort of that strategic empathy of um, trying to understand where the other side are coming from. So not so much the, the Russian elites, but perhaps the, the Russian people and, and why they might support what they think is happening in Ukraine, not for the purpose of agreeing with them or, or justifying it or in any way legitimizing the views, but just in order so that you can understand it. Um, because, you know, even if, 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 if even if somebody's your enemy, it's better if you can understand them. And I'm not saying the Russian people should be the enemy. And I thought that um, that necessarily, I, I thought that President Biden's um, decision to to make it easier for um, essentially for, for for talented young Russians to to get visas, I thought that was very clever. I thought it was um, I thought it was a really clever move. I'd like to see um, the British government doing doing something similar. So I think that idea of of how of the consequences, and it does tie in a bit to what Ben was saying around sanctions, but as well the consequences of how we do end up framing this conflict, because as I've already said, it, it seems pretty clear that a majority of Russians do support what they see to be going on. Um, and I, I don't want to sort of pretend that this is all just, you know, um, one, you know, one crazy dictator is imposing his will um, on, on 140 odd million people. But at the same point in the long run, um, and again, this links back into to Ben's point about who's going to come to power after Putin. It, it might be more helpful for the West if Putin, if there's a narrative created where Putin is something that can be externalized, um, rather than if it's made out like you know this was the Russian people's war and 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 they did they did this. It might might be better if um, Putin, if it's something that was externalized, something that was imposed. And I think that's one area that I'd like to see as a few a little bit more focus on. Sort of what sort of narratives around what sort of narratives um, might be a better long-term strategy um, for for it sounds it sounds so utopian. I always don't want to say it out loud, but for, for imagining a Russia without Putin or somebody like Putin, but I think we have to at least imagine it, even if even if it does feel utopian. And of course, none of this should ever take any precedence over helping you. Ukrainian people and helping them in their self-defense against Russia, but it, you know we, we can think about more than more than one thing at once. Well, I, I can't thank you both enough. I'd be remiss if I didn't plug your books, respectively. Uh, Dr. Ben Noble's book, Navalny: Putin's Nemesis, Russia's Future, is absolutely fantastic. It is one of the most insightful books on Russian politics that I've certainly come across and enjoyed reading. And then Dr. Jay McGlynn's forthcoming book, The Kremlin's Memory Makers, which I cannot wait to get my hands on. Hopefully, it's coming out soonish. November, I think. Um, so hopefully they can put a pen on it and not have to constantly update it as you know, Ben was talking about for his class notes. Uh, so thank you very much on behalf of Chairman Rogers and Representative Nye for this absolutely fantastic conversation, uh, which will be posted into YouTube soon. And I look forward to sharing a pint and a cup of tea with you both very soon. Thanks, Joshua. Thank you, thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Thanks.